When you entered the sanctuary this morning, you walked over a mosaic of tribes, the names and symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel. Our school uses the mosaic to teach the names of Jacob's sons. I love watching a little Benjamin or Asher or Judah recognize their name as they explore the stones. That's me. They have an immediate sense of connection. I am part of this place. The symbolism strikes me every time I step on the mosaic and enter this awe-inspiring temple. Our community is made up of many different groups of people. The coming together of hundreds of little stones into a beautiful whole. The story of our people, of our ancestors, forming the literal foundation of this sacred place. The mosaic also makes me think of family vacations of my childhood. Sitting on a train or taking a tour, my dad would observe a fellow traveler and whisper to me, M.O.T.? <laughs> Member of the tribe? I would nod discreetly, giving him the courage to test out this hypothesis carefully. <laughs> Where are you from? Oh, we actually have friends that live near there, the Steins. Maybe you know them. My dad made an art of sending out Jewish geography vibes, of finding other members of our tribe. Yet today, tribe has become a dirty word in contemporary discourse. Stanford professor Robert Reich writes articles like the new tribalism and the decline of the nation state. Yale professor Amy Chua's recently well-received book, Political Tribes, warns that tribalism encompasses a vehement and sometimes violent instinct to exclude abroad and here in America. In his eulogy for Senator McCain, former Vice President Biden said, John understood that America was first and foremost an idea, audacious and risky, organized around not tribe, but ideals. Tribalism has become a catch-all for dangerous societal divisions, from the root of the conflict in Afghanistan to the source of the divided partisan discord in America. And amidst this debate, I wonder, are they talking about us? Are we still members of a tribe? Is it a different kind of tribe? If so, what does that mean? What can it mean for us in San Francisco today? The conversation really came to a head this summer within the American Jewish community. In May, Hebrew Union College, our seminary, invited local acclaimed writer Michael Shabon, Shabon to speak at graduation in Los Angeles. He challenged the recently ordained rabbis with his critique of the boundaries, the ghettos as he calls them, that Judaism draws. The whole thing's a giant interlocking system of distinctions and divisions, and the means through prayer and ritual, through narrative and commentary, of drawing them. Sheban explained that he has decided to retreat from Jewish life, because he does not want to condone what he sees as a dangerous ideology. Despite having given his four children a rich Jewish upbringing, he hopes that they will now reject Jewish tribalism. So now today at this retrograde and perilous moment in history, when ideologues are busy trying to string the world with aerovim of intolerance, were you to ask me if I hope my children marry in, I would say yes, I want them to marry into the tribe that prizes learning, inquiry, skepticism, and openness to new ideas. 
His words drew strong criticism, particularly because of his condemnation of the actions of the State of Israel. And if we ever get to have that cup of coffee in Berkeley that I have often fantasized about, I have a lot of thoughts that I would like to share with him. But underneath Sheban's complex Jewish baggage and extreme reactions, he challenges all of us with deeper questions, questions that feel very real to me. How do we come to terms with our Jewish identity within the culture of the Bay Area? How do we feel proud or at least comfortable with our multi-layered religious, ethnic, spiritual Jewish selves? I hear our community raising this questions in different raising these questions in different ways. I hear it in the words of a startup founder at a dinner party in the mission who tells me that he grew up Jewish but doesn't really identify anymore because Judaism feels kind of racist. I hear it in the words of a high school student who tells me that it's not really cool to be Jewish at their prestigious private school because it is part of the dominant cultural narrative. She actually said that, dominant cultural narrative. I hear it in the words of a newly hired programmer at a big tech company. She gets up the nerve to tell her team that she won't be at work on Wednesday because it's Yom Kippur. And one colleague responds, wow, you are like the first religious person that I have ever met in San Francisco. I hear it in the words of a kindergarten parent who thinks that it's nice to learn Hebrew and important to know one's heritage, but fears that Jewish day school is dangerously insular. The underlying questions, are we too exclusive? Too ethnic, but not ethnic enough? Too old school in an increasingly flat intersectional world? So when I listened to the commencement address, I confess that my first response was frustration with Sheban's blanket rejection of Jewish life. That's not us, I wanted to say. Stop simplifying and caricaturing Judaism because it is convenient for your rhetoric or it assuages your guilt. My Judaism does teach learning, skepticism, openness, equality, and freedom. We just chanted from this very Torah portion in Deuteronomy 29, Atem nitzavim hayom kulchem. You stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, even the stranger within your camp, from woodchopper to water drawer. Velo itchem levadchem. I make this covenant not with you alone, but both with those who are standing here with us this day before God, and with those who are not here with us this day. I can value respect towards and inclusion of all people and still be part of the organized Jewish community. They don't feel mutually exclusive. It's not all or nothing. Not all distinctions and divisions are inherently exclusionary. We need shelter in our lives safe places to protect us from the elements. We marry under a chuppah. We celebrate the harvest under a sukkah. They are temporary places because we have often been forced to wander and take refuge. But they are still covered because there are times when we need our tradition to protect us. There is a larger context to this debate. Jean-Paul Sartre talked about the unique politics of assimilation for Jews. Sartre thought that secularism, especially socialism and communism, appeals to Jews because it gives them the sense of relief to embrace a world without religion, rather than having to deal with being a religious minority. For Jews who are subconsciously embarrassed or even angry at having to be Jewish, Secularism or universalism can be a way for them to escape, for them to erase the self entirely. But it's not the solution 
The question is right, but the answer is not. Radical universalism destabilizes. When nothing distinguishes one person from another, we are left with the vacuum of extreme individualism, where everything just becomes nothing. Each of us alone, without humility, alienated from anything bigger that can call us to be responsible, ethical beings. A tribe, at its heart, puts the group before the individual. It helps us act as one giant Meshuggah family, where individuals are willing to sacrifice for the greater good. When I stop ranting French philosophy at my computer screen, and I take time to sit with these ideas, my second response to the address is more torn because I too struggle with the boundaries of Jewish life. I'm not an ultra-Orthodox rabbi in a closed community in upstate New York. I lead a complicated, diverse community in the most dynamic city in the world. And I try to teach an open, inclusive, diverse interpretation of Torah. And I do it with a conviction that I am shaping the future of this tradition with authenticity, and with respect. Yet my most powerful Jewish experiences, the core pieces that drive me to fight for Kalal Yisrael, the survival of all the Jewish people, are deeply ethnic. My Jewish soul was shaped by listening to stories of my grandmother hiding during the Holocaust, watching all the adults I trusted cry when Rabin was assassinated helping a newly arrived Russian family figure out how to shop at the overwhelming local grocery store, eating brunches at Gilbert's and Bagelstein's in North Dallas, and reading very long Philip Roth novels. <laughs> when I watched my husband David raise up Aaron at his bris, flanked by our parents, tears streaming down his face as we pronounced our son part of the Brit, part of the covenant. I believed in the God of Abraham and the God of Sarah like I had never believed before. I'm very tribal. <laughs> and sometimes, usually late at night, after eight years of serving this community, I have moments of doubt. Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm not that different from the Orthodox Jews that he assails. Maybe I'm not doing the best thing for my own three children. Maybe my experience of Judaism cannot and should not survive. That the world is taking sides between two polarities and that my stand in the center will fall between the cracks. And then I fall asleep and I wake up the next morning and walk into the courtyard and see the mosaic and feel a renewed faith and connection. I believe in a particular tradition in a universal world. Judaism is right for me, but that does not mean that it is better. It is ours. We were born into it. We fell into it. We actively sought it out and chose it. We inherit identity, but we also created anew with each generation. We construct ourselves. Reformed Jews have always struggled with the hardest questions of particularism versus universalism. The immigrant families that founded this congregation embraced the modern world with gusto. They had extravagant Christmas parties and also built this impossible to miss dome. They left us to live in the buffer zone between the holy and the mundane, the secular and the religious. As reformed Jews, we refuse to find safety in black and white. Our approach has made us porous and open, while also at times dangerously shape-shifting and diluted. It may seem like the easy way out, but ultimately, it is the hardest place to be emotionally and spiritually. To brave the gray area. 
to move with the waves of modernity and post-modernity while still holding fast to the tree of life, to the Eitz Chaim that is Torah. We exist in the horizontal in the relationship that we have with those around us, our friends, our family, our colleagues. But we also exist in the vertical, in those that came before us, and in those that stood at Sinai, in those that will come after us, Lodor Vador, from generation to generation. Tribalism is dangerous. The risks are real, now more than ever. But we are not part of the problem at our best, we are part of the solution. This is the time that we need liberal Judaism and liberal Jews more than ever. Rav Cook, the first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of pre-state Israel taught that each Jew has a four-fold song. There is a person who sings the song of his soul finds everything complete spiritual satisfaction within. There is a person who sings the song of her nation, who steps forward from the private soul, who yearns for the heights, who clings with sensitive love to the entirety of the Jewish nation. There is a person whose soul is so broad that it expands beyond the border of Israel and sings the song of humanity. And there is a person who rises even higher, united with all existence, with all creatures, and with all worlds. And there is a person who rises with all these songs together, in one ensemble, so that they all give forth their voices. We are an ensemble, a mosaic, a particular tradition in a universal world. We can hold all four dimensions at the same time in one whole persona. These issues are both new and timeless. Jewish identity is changing in ways that we do not recognize and that at times scare us. This isn't the first time that this has happened in modern Jewish history. We are emotes members of this tribe, although not exactly the way that my dad meant it. We may not look like it or sound like it, but we are emotes. We have chosen and crafted this fluid yet established community. We dwell together in this house of God, this sanctuary from the quickly changing morally relative reality outside. As we enter 5779 on the very particular Jewish calendar, may we be a tribe that is brave enough to recognize and celebrate a Judaism of the future that looks different from our own. May we be a tribe that believes enough in a particular Torah and its universal truths, its ability to adapt to anything and remain true to its core. May we be the Jews that question what is Jewish, but never question that we each belong. May we be Jews who create a wide tent, Jews that include, but never erase. Shana Tovah.